you got to treat it just like you treated the game. You know, you got to study it. You got to put the time in it. You got to have something to talk about. You got to be relatable. You got to be personable. This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Engineers. Podcast Engineers is one of the easiest ways to get your podcast edited and managed in a simple and sequential process. Hello and welcome to the Over Everything Podcast. This is the podcast where we receive stories, tips, and tactics from entrepreneurs who have done it. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen Osinde. And today, the brand has legs. You know what I'm saying? We have a special guest in the building, somebody who is an NBA champion, who has one of the best sports podcasts out. We got Matt Barnes on the show. Matt Barnes, what's going on? How are you? Fellas, how you guys doing? Fantastic. We're blessed, man. We're blessed. Mm, Most likewise, definitely, man. Likewise. So to kick things off, you know, um, we did something different. Uh, we actually played one-on-one, and we want to get your reaction to us playing <laughs> one-on-one. You know what I'm saying? A- a- and see what I, your thoughts are. All right, all right. So I'm going to share my screen I, with you real quick. And I'm gonna say gonna my, see, I'm what, gonna say my comments think? after, bro. I'm gonna say my comments. I'm not gonna say anything to get in Matt Barnes's head, but I'm gonna say my comments after. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's play it up, Al. Yes, sir. Y'all, can y'all see my screen? Yeah, it's yep. pulling up. So, Matt, th- just for context, this is a game up to three. Yeah, it's okay. a game, quick, quick game up to three. You know what I'm saying? We're not gonna watch a, a full, a full. You know what I'm saying? We got things to talk about. Let's do it. So start it off slow, air ball. Right, y'all, you see that jumper, Matt? Boom. That one, that right? wasn't that there. Was, yeah, that looked good. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. Look oh, at him. He's trying. Damn, look at that. I, I lost my. I know, like, that the video is kind of laggy, but, like, I think uh, it hit the back of my foot. All right, let's see if you. So, if, if your goal was the league, then, then you have to, definitely had to beat Alex, then, right? If your goal was the league and you've been playing your whole of course, life. I'll just let you, I'll, I'll let you see the resume, what you're about to see in this quick one minute. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, all right. Uh, Cookies. Yeah. Oh, uh, that he, lead talk. he had that. He had that clamps on me. All right, look at that. I think he put me in the spin cycle here. <laughs> He's like spin. That was a nice move. You got to make oh, it. Oh yeah, he made oh, it. And he made it. Okay. I have a little spin cycle. Oh, and he gives us any. Hey, and he gives us the replay. Okay. Uh, look I at that. With the instant replay. <laughs> you see me? Spin cycle. I've been Michael. <laughs> you see me? All right, uh, all right. Listen, that's not to let y'all know. It's g- give y'all the replay and all that. All right. All right, let's go out. Let let show 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 Matt how I finished you up, bro. Matt, look at this. See see Matt. If I if I was your height, six seven six eight, I'd definitely be in the league with that jumper. Look at that. It'd be over. See huh? that? Look at that smooth stroke. <laughs> that's a that's a NBA ready jumper right there, Matt. <laughs> so two, two. It's two to one right it now. It's three right? to one because I think that was a three. Oh, that was, the that game. was a game. Oh, that, that was, was a game. two-pointer. Yeah. That was a game winner. Uh, you won because okay. you, you counted twos. Okay. You know, and, and let me ask you okay. something. And on one-on-one, is it fair to count twos up to three? Or should it all be ones? Uh, I mean, I mean, it just depends on the rules you got to make before. I mean, everyone's shooting threes now, so obviously threes are a big part of it. But, I mean, that's that's up to y'all. Mm-hmm. Word. Let me ask you something. What do you think about that, you know? Well, what are your thoughts on like how the game has been moving to like, consistently shooting threes? You think that's like good for the game or just just where it is? Uh, I mean, I mean, I just think it, it, it's where the game is mm-hmm. at. You know, I think the game is, you know, in a great place right now with a lot of young talent. Um, you know, obviously, when I came to the league in the early two thousands, it was, you know, live by the three, die by the three. There weren't teams winning by shooting the three point ball. It was more of an inside out yeah. game. But, you know, as, you know, people like Steph Curry and Klay Thompson have, have come into the game, I think they've completely changed the dynamic of not only the NBA, but the way basketball overall has been played. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I coach my kids who are 14, been coaching them since they were about eight or nine. And, you know, they don't get warmed up in the, in, in the paint. You know, they start shooting half-court shots yeah. or deep threes. Like, they even get warm. So it's just like the whole dynamic has changed. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm someone who – Obviously played in a different era, but I I love this era and I love this style of basketball. Yeah, because before, like when you get in the gym, like any hooper, you want to get a couple bunnies under the the, the rim, a couple layups, get going yeah. and everything. And when you were coming in the league, right, you came in as like you know you were a second rounder, you know, did a mm-hmm. UCLA everything. When you were in college at the time, 
Um, how did you see your future playing out into going to the NBA? Did you foresee yourself having a long career? And um, how did you switch up your game over time to really stay current with how the league was evolving? Um, well, you know, I at UCLA, I was an undersized four man. Um, so I played point guard and wing my whole life, but we had a great recruiting class the year before mine and the year I came in. So, you know, I told the coach, I just want to get on the court. So I was kind of playing a power forward position. And this is before small ball was what it is now. I mean, now small ball is the game, but back then it was different. So, you know, playing at UCLA, obviously I had aspirations to go into the mm -hmm. league and, you know, I worked my butt off to, to be able to get there. But when I got there, it was, you know, the traditional point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward center. So I had to, you know, really do a lot of catching up because I was 6'8", mm -hmm. you know, so I had to go back out to the wing. So it took me a few years to kind of just get, you know, that guard game or the wing game down. But throughout my career, I, I kind of slowly saw the game change into small ball. So it was really, you know, towards the end of my career, you know, I was able to play two through five almost, just depending on what the matchups were. So, um, you know, my career was a grind. It, it didn't start easy. Uh, you know, the first handful of teams, I was on one-year deals and bounced around a little bit, but I kind of feel like I found my footing in the 2007 season with the Warriors on that We Believe oh, team. And then, you know, from there, just, you know, was a consistent you know, fixture, whether I was starting or, you know, one of the first guys coming off the bench, I was definitely always, you know, in the mm. mix. I, I want to ask you about that uh, Baron Davis dunk on, uh, was it Karolinko? Yeah, that was one of the greatest in-game dunks. Like, you watching that live, how did you react to that? I mean, because I was, I was, I think I was in grade six, seven at the time, and I was, like, watching the playoffs. And I remember the, the series you guys played against the Mavericks. It was, like, I think Don Nelson had you guys playing super fast, like, up, down, up, down, up, down. But back to that dunk, like, how did you, like, when you saw it live, like, what was your first reaction, like, when you saw it happen? Literally, like like everyone else, like, a, oh, my God, and I cover my face. Like, what what did I just witness? You know, obviously, you know, getting a chance to play with Baron in college and then playing again with them in the NBA was a blessing. And he was someone that, to me, if he didn't get injured, he had an opportunity to be a, a top five point guard all time. I mean, his size, strength, speed, skill level, no holes in his game, played both sides of the ball. He was special. Uh, but that dunk in particular – kind of came out of nowhere because he was beat up. He had a bad knee and a bad back. And all of a sudden he turns the corner and, you know, I really feel like Kirilenko was the one that beat us in that series. He did such a great job of guarding Steven Jackson and Baron Davis at times that, you know, he was the stopper in that series and, and kind of put us away. But Baron definitely got him that one particular play and it was incredible. Yeah, even the celebration was iconic. <laughs> <laughs> right, lifting the lifting shirt up. Lifting the shirt up, man. <laughs> Most definitely, man. So I want to like, get into your time playing with Kobe, man. Because mm -hmm. uh, looking into your 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 you know repertoire and just like your your time uh, as a Laker, there was a lot that must have been learned with your relationship with Kobe, you know. But I'm curious because you've talked about being on the court with him a lot. But what are some of the things you learned being off the court with Kobe? Um, you know, Kobe was just different. You know, obviously. On the court, he was the Mamba. But, you know, I just got a chance to know the person off the court, you know, the, the, the behind the scenes. And he was just, you know, cool, relaxed, a shit talker, you know, laughed, had a good time. Um, but I think one thing that I would say I learned is taking the same discipline that he played with and, and that athletes have in the game and applying that to our next career. So, you know, obviously he was – taking off in business, uh, you know, I, during, you know, with his unfortunately untimely death, but, you know, just to be able to take that same passion and energy and attention to detail from the court to the business space is, is something that, you know, I definitely picked up on that, that, that he was all about and something that I was about. And when I saw him and had him, he kind of explained that to me, you know, I was doing something right. Cause I was already kind of thinking like, you know, we're naturally trained to get up and be disciplined, be up at 6 a.m. and, you know, get on the track or start with weights. But, you know, now we're getting up that early. And we get on emails and, and, and conference calls. So it's kind of just, you know, transitioning to what was next and to have the same discipline and approach that we had in the NBA to business. Yeah. Um, as a player, you know, you were like the, you're a great defender, can shoot the three. 
And I remember like there was like you're a very chippy player from like what I saw on TV. And there was like one play, and I know what play you're about to ask me where you were inbounding the ball, but from the angle you're inbounding it, Kobe's guarding you. What actually happened on that play? You know, like now that I have a chance to ask you, it's been something that's been a staple in like every top 10 <laughs> ESPN sports center. But what right. happened from that angle? Were you actually throwing out his face or was it just the there was like Nah, I wanted to fight. I wanted to fight. Really? Eh? <laughs> um, he, you know, you know, Kobe was a guy obviously who was tremendous talent, but he's also kind of he tried to mentally uh, dominate as well. So he would do little dirty shit like elbow you, grab mm-hmm. you. That particular game, he'd elbow me probably three or four times. Arrest didn't call nothing. So I was to the point where like, fuck basketball, <laughs> we're gonna fight. You know, and and uh, on that at that particular play, um, it wasn't planned. Literally, when like when I tell this story, literally my arms did it all by themselves. Like it wasn't like, hey, I'm gonna fake the ball in his face. I literally just did it because I really wanted to just throw the ball at him. Like I wanted to fight. That's where my mind was. So I faked the ball, uh, not realizing how close it came to him. Obviously, until it's all over every broadcast after that, and literally was you know eyelashes away from smashing him in the face. And you know <laughs> the fact that he didn't flinch, uh, you know, just goes to show what kind of dog and competitor he was. Yeah. Just the ball to get that close to your face, and it's like it's like it's like psychotic. Right. <laughs> like, how do you not react yeah. to that? I mean, we you know we we flinch at pillows being thrown at us or someone acting like they're going to hit us, and there was a full fledged ball coming from me because he knows I would have hit him, and the fact that he didn't flinch is that's just how in tuned he was, and it was uh, again he was just different, special. So, one thing that was interesting was you know hearing that you guys wake up at four thirty a.m. No, that was him. That was him. That, that wasn't y'all. Yeah. Nah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, when I, you know, he used to invite me out to Orange County to work out with him. And he, you know, I thought, okay, I would drive in in the morning. It's like an hour and some change. He's like, no, nah, we're going to be up. So you need to get a hotel out here. I'm like, oh, shit. Okay. So, I, you know, went and got a hotel out there. And we're on, the, we're on the track at 430 before the sun even comes up. And we're running laps and sprints and doing different kinds of things. And then. You know, from there, we're in the in the gym, and we lift weights so hard, I feel like I can't even lift my arms up. And then from there, you know, we're to the court to get shots up. And, you know, I was someone who obviously prided myself on working hard, and I did work very hard, but getting a chance to work with him was just a different level, um, just to see how hard he goes, how serious he takes it every single day. Um, and obviously, the finished product was, you know, one of the greatest players of all time, so... You know, he was obsessed with trying to be the greatest player uh, ever to live, and he came damn close to it, if not did it. Most definitely. Now, with you being on, like, six-plus teams or on seven teams, right, what did you learn about being a team player that now, you know, translates into being in the business world? You know, because being a star athlete, you know, it's a different mentality that you got to have to switch into you know being either a role player or you know fitting into the different modes of a team right so i would love to know like some Mm -hmm. of the strategies you must have learned from being in multiple teams yeah i mean i just obviously being a team player being a role player you know i've always been to, to to the notion of you know i'd rather be a small piece of something big and then own a big piece of nothing. I think obviously, you know, the goal now is to have ownership, you know what I mean? And everyone wants to be owners and obviously that is the goal and and that's what we want to do. But I've always been open to situations that I'm in that I, that that I am an owner. You know, I would rather, you know, bring people in and, and give them equity that I feel like can strategically help a business play. And obviously it would lessen my percentage but at the same time, it's going to grow the business. So again, you know, like the way I look at it is, you know, I'd, I'd rather have a small piece of something big where it's mine, but I've, you know, delegated out shares to people that are going to make the business better than to have a whole company that isn't worth shit, you know, because I, oh, it's mine. I'm owning it. I don't want to give none of this out. So I just think obviously being a team player and playing in team sports so long, you realize that you know, I always say, you know, like the fist is stronger than a finger. You know what I mean? I love when people are able to come together and, you know, become stronger than trying to be like one person that stands out and, and, and doesn't, you know, turn into anything. So that would probably be the main thing I took. I, I feel like I took from sports and have brought to businesses, you know, understanding your strengths and weaknesses and strategically aligning your business with people who you feel like can help in multiple different ways. Yeah. 
No, it's huge. You notice that with, uh, yeah, you notice that with players who come in the league, right? Like you're the man in college and high school, but then you got to adapt towards actually serving for the bigger purpose towards like winning a championship. Right. And like sports and business are so synonymous in like many different ways and like how you work together, how you build towards something. Not everyone can be the number one guy. Like, even though you were the number one guy on the team before, like you got to spread out. Like if someone's better at you and doing that certain role, let them come in and maybe play the number two. But at the end of the day, you're going to win a championship. If you stick to that core belief that, okay, you're better serving this. Let's all drive towards that championship and, and give it a shot. Well, I just feel like, you know, one thing I remember Doc Rivers saying is just like, you know, be a star in your role. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously everyone in the NBA was a star in high school or if they're overseas on their overseas team. And then obviously you're a big fish in a small pond. When you go to college, obviously the pond is, you know, has a lot more big fish in it. So you got to kind of find your way there. And then, you know, when you get to the NBA, the superstars are, you know, there's a handful of superstars and, you know, as good as some guys are, some guys are star role players. You know what I mean? So, you know, my goal is always just to be a, a star in my role. I knew what my role was on the, you know, my, my, my role was to, you know, bring defensive intensity, rebound, hustle, do the little things, you know, knock down the shots when I'm open and, and, and bring good energy. And I think what messes a lot of people up in their career or people that don't end up, who are talented, that don't end up having a long career is because they don't buy into their role. You know, again, there's there's ton of roles on a team. And if you can buy into being in that role, you know, I was fortunate enough to play as long as I want. You know, rarely does someone like me. I was a role player. You know, rarely does someone like me get to walk away from the game. Normally, like the phone just stops ringing. But, you know, I was able to win a championship. I had two more years on my deal and I just decided, hey, you know, I'm ready for what's next. And I was still paid for those two deals because my money was guaranteed. But I just felt like, hey, you know, I had a 15 year run. Um, I'm missing a lot of time with my kids. I'm ready to see what this next chapter of my life holds. And I was able to walk away. But, you know, I could have played another two or three years because I knew exactly what teams were looking for when they brought me in. Mm, yeah, I wish you came on the Raptors, man, because we needed a 3 and D <laughs> guy at the time. Um, I think after the Warriors run was over, but um, that's when you're kind of entering the media space. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking on the media space, man. As your career was ending, did you have an inclination to be in media or were you considering other options uh, towards like after your MBA life? Yeah, I had no idea um, that the media would be an option and it would be something that I would, you know, elevate in. Um, I wanted, you know, I'm a big cannabis advocate. So when I first got out of the NBA, I wanted to kind of try to help change the policies in, in the NBA with the four random tests. So myself and my brother Al Harrington, who has a cannabis company as well. Uh, we were, you know, flying out to New York and meeting with the Players Association and the NBA about, you know, their regulations on cannabis. And, you know, happy to say that obviously we didn't change the rules, but I think we are a small part of people just kind of making them understand that, you know, how beneficial this plant was. So that was my first goal coming out of the NBA was to kind of be the shield for these players and find out a way to, you know, hopefully stop these drug tests from 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 popping up and, and messing people's careers up. So, um you know, small part of that. But then a friend of mine can, you know, always used to tell me like, you were so well spoken in your interviews, you should try being an analyst or, you know, being, you know, doing games. I'm just like, nah, you know, I, I think I had enough of basketball. I want to do something else. She's like, well, just try it one time. And if you don't like it, I'll leave you alone. And I tried it and I liked it. You know what I mean? And, and I was getting positive feedback and people were saying I was pretty good at it. So I kind of started taking it serious and studying up on it and, you know, treating it like how I treated basketball. Like I watched film and, made sure I watched the games on my off time so I know what I'm talking about. And, you know, lo and behold, I kind of started to climb the ladder um, in the media space and doors started opening, you know, a podcast presented itself. Um, you know, we, 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 I did my due diligence to kind of learn that and brought my brother Steven Jackson in and, you know, signed a deal with Showtime with no sizzle reel, just me pitching an idea of what I thought a cool show would be. They bought it. And, you know, the first year out of the gates, we win sports podcast of the year. So, um, again, and through that, more doors have opened. So, really, I have to say media has been really the driving force behind my retirement. And, you know, outside of investments I've made, just as far as me continuing to climb in the media space, you know, with working at ESPN and working for the Sacramento Kings, working for the LA Clippers, um, having my podcast, I just really feel like I've been able to kind of find a home um in this media space and you know i'm gonna run with it yeah man congrats on that yeah congrats appreciate on that. it um especially your, one of your most recent episodes with will smith that was legendary 
Yeah, man, that was it big was, time. Uh, dream come true. You know what I mean? When I created this show in I think 2018, it was just like, damn, if we can ever get Will Smith, I'll be on top of the world. You know, and lo and behold, you know, a little bit over three years, almost four years later, um, the stars aligned and, uh, you know, he was gracious enough to give us a little bit of his time. And, um, it was amazing. You know, I just feel like, you know, that unfortunate Oscar slap kind of not necessarily damaged him, but, you know, people wanted to, you know, have it define him. And I think, you know, yeah. he's been a, 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 a hero for the black community for so long and, and, and has always kind of walked the straight and narrow and never really been in trouble. And all of a sudden, you know, people want to turn one incident into, you know, this is who he is. So I really was happy that he gave us an opportunity to kind of obviously discuss that, but many other things. And, and I mean, he was just transparent and he was vulnerable and he was laughing and he cried and he was talking shit. And it was just mm -hmm. a really dope uh, interview that I hope um, everyone gets a chance to see because uh, I think it was needed for both of us. 1, yeah, he was like very vulnerable, very vulnerable in the whole, in the whole episode. Yeah. Yeah, no, he was dope. Now, what what struck me was when he talked about the uh, the uh, the actors spitting on him, and he just yeah, took that. that was, you that know what I'm crazy. saying? Like, <laughs> that, I don't know about that one. Like, I I would have to be like cut. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? That's serious. It's no, on that, site. That, that that whole yeah, that whole thing was dope. You know what I mean? Because I don't know if you got a chance to. Uh, I don't even think it's out yet, but we got a chance. To, you know, we got a chance to see the movie and that particular character. He played his role so well. So when he said that he spit on him and was like in character, like if you see the whole thing, like once you see the movie, he said like he went right from right when everyone checked in, like he went and stayed in, on his like his little tent that was on site. Like this dude was locked in and he played he played the role so well, you would think he really hated black people. You know, that's how fucking good <laughs> the guy was at the role. But, you know, when he said he spit on him and all that kind of shit, I'm with you. Like, uh, okay, we're acting and shit, but don't you ever fucking spit on me. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, oh, my <laughs> days, right, that's, man. Uh, that's disrespect, that's, that's man. Different. That's, that's, that's different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yo, you know, one thing as podcasters, you know, we're studying the game. And one of the things that you did that was legendary is have your podcast mm -hmm. be on two networks. You know what I'm saying? Could you break mm -hmm. that down for the podcast creators that are listening to the show? Yeah. So what happened was uh, obviously very thankful and happy to be in partnership with Showtime. But after the first season, uh, I really didn't feel like their, their offer to us matched what we brought to the table. You know, I felt like we yeah. grew showtime basketball obviously to what it is today but at the time it was growing very fast and i just didn't feel like their offer matched and they were kind of stood on their offer so i said thank you but you know i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna look around you know i'm gonna see i feel like we have something special here so you know i personally started calling and and really learning the business and talking to apple and spotify and amazon and you name it i talked to him and by the time Showtime kind of came back around. I developed a really good relationship with iHeart. So I told Showtime, I was just like, obviously, I would love to return, you know, now that the money is is representing, you know, what we bring to the table. But I also want to bring iHeart into the fold. And, um, you know, we all sat down and talked and figured out that uh, iHeart can do the audio side of it because since, you know, they're the biggest radio distributor I think in the world and that Showtime would do the digital side along with YouTube. So right there, we were able to merge and get paid for not only our audio because some podcasts are just audio. So we were able to get a, a, a very good salary for the audio side. And then also the same, uh, the same deal for the, for the digital side. So we were able to really literally double up on the same show, which I know a lot of people at the time weren't doing, some people may do it now, but you know, at the time you're in with your one company and that's kind of it. So I was able to, you know, kind of somewhat change the game, so to speak, and be able to bring iHeart and Showtime to the table together and was able to get paid off of both. And, and Matt, in, in deals like that, um, of course they're paying you for having your show on their platforms, but in terms of like ownership over the, you know, your show, right? Like, how does mm -hmm. that work? Do they want in perpetuity? Maybe when your contract is over, they still want to make nah, money off of you. No, no. But, so what? No, what they did was, you know, obviously we signed. I think we signed two year deals at a time. So mm -hmm. we just signed a new two year deal with um, with Showtime, and and our deal is up this month with iHeart. And there, obviously, there's a few. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, 
and our deals up with iHeart and we'll return to them. We're just working out the numbers right now, but uh, how ownership works. I, I was, again, I was new to the game when I first came in and I had someone that swore he knew what he was doing, uh, negotiate my first deal with Showtime. Cause it was, you know, a super minimal deal. And my thing was, I just want to get on air and kind of show what I'm worth. So this fucking fucking idiot gave a hundred percent of the IP to Showtime. So at the beginning, I didn't own any of something I completely created. Uh, luckily, again, the relationship with Showtime is so good that they ended up giving me 50% of my IP back. So I own, I'm 50-50 partners with Showtime, and iHeart is just something we kind of lease the audio to. So iHeart has no ownership. They're just a distributor for our the audio portion of our podcast. Genius. Genius. One thing I'm curious about is, do you guys have any geofences on that? Like... For instance, you've been playing basketball for years, and China's a huge market, right? So does Showtime be like, all right, yo, you can go to China and release it over there? I mean, whatever we do, we're in conjunction. So I know people do see it over there because, you know, we have fans from around the world that kind of tap in, and, you know, YouTube is goes all the way around the world. So um, we don't personally take it anywhere. I mean, obviously, it's, it's available if you want to find it, but we don't personally like get up and say, Hey, you know, we're going to go do something in China. But if we ever were to do something like that, obviously it would be a, a, a 50, 50 split with us and Showtime. Yeah. And, and with um, all the smoke, right? Because right now you're seeing like a lot of players in the NBA start their own podcast because they want to create their own narrative. They want to tell their own stories. What is it that made all the smoke such a cultural staple like than any other podcast that's started by other NBA players? I mean, I can think about like Road Tripping, uh, mm -hmm. Old Man of the Three is a great show, but mm -hmm. yours is somewhat eclipsing everybody like by a mile. What is it that you and Stack speak about just to make it pop? Is it just the chemistry between you two? Uh, because every NBA player drops a show, but it never really gets on the radar. So I want to get your thought process behind making all the smoke such a big hit piece compared to other players because every other every other NBA player talks about brings other people to interview, but it just never really gets there. What's that X factor that you guys have that no other person has? Well, I appreciate that uh, to begin with, and yeah, there are some other you know Draymond show, uh, Old Man and the Three, Road Trip, and Knuckleheads. You know, all those guys are my brothers and, you know, I'm happy for everyone to get out and create and be able to tell their own story because for so long, everyone else has been telling our story. I think what separates us is, I think, one, our chemistry, you know, Jack and I are, are real life brothers and, you know, probably similar to you guys where we can talk shit back and forth to each other and not be offended. But if someone else said that same stuff to them, it's yeah. like to us, it would be a fight. Like, no, nah, you can't say that because I don't know you like that, you know, but me and Jack can talk shit back and forth to each other and, and, and laugh about it. And I, so I think our chemistry is big. And then also I feel like the environment we create around our show, you know what I mean? If you ever come to a live tape when we do a live taping with the guests, you know, we got the music playing, we're smoking, we got food, we got drinks. We want you just to come in and relax before we just jump right on camera. You know what I mean? Like we want to, you know, we'll, we'll sit down and smoke and talk about something completely different than the show before you know, we actually get on the show. So I think it's an environment we create. And then I also just think they, you know, our reputation, you know, we've always been outspoken people who've never really been about bullshit. We're not trying to go viral for the wrong reasons. We're not trying to do clickbait. You know, we want to go viral for the right reasons. And, you know, I've always, and I say it every time I talk about this, I want to humanize our guests like show. I mean, everyone knows how great Steph Curry is on the court, but you know, how did Steph become that player and what is he like when he's outside of basketball? And I, you know, I really try to be able to have them feel comfortable enough where they can share who they really are. And, you know, my favorite thing, you know, as a host is when they say like, Will just did a last show, like, Hey, I've never told no one this story. You know what I mean? And, and, and that shows you right there that they feel comfortable enough to share some real shit with us because as athletes, you know, the media is kind of touch and go, you know, because especially today, I mean, the media is so negative and, and, and people try to twist words and, 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 you know, say shit to benefit them. That's never been us. You know, again, we've always been straight shooters. We're always going to, you know, protect our guests and, and, and ride for our guests. And I, I think they appreciate that. Um, so, 
Yeah, I definitely think we've set the bar. I feel like some shows have kind of caught up to us somewhat. Um, so, you know, now we're trying to elevate and, and do more things with, you know, animation, live shows, traveling shows, um, round tables. So we're, we're going to continue to try to kind of push the, uh, continue to push the bar, so to speak, to uh, continue to, you know, kind of be at the top of this game. When it comes to, you know, competing, you know, one thing you've been able to do consistently is, you know, grow the brand, right? So one of the things that's tough now is like talking about your fellow, you know, all ball players without being disrespectful. You know what I'm saying? How do you kind of navigate that, especially if someone's not performing well and they're thinking that, that you're shitting on them and, and you're like, no, nah, I'm just keeping it a buck. <laughs> like, how do you deal with yeah. that? Cause, yeah, I know that could, it could be, you know, an up and down situation. Yeah, it's a real thin line with that. And, you know, I touched on this before. I feel like the media now is so disrespectful. Yeah. And I just, I, I'm not for that. You know, I'm not for, because I know a lot of these media people that are, pounding their chest and talking all this big shit on TV would never say it to that person's face. You know, I only say stuff that I would, that I would say to someone's face. And obviously being a former player, it's tough because our job now is to critique if critiquing is needed, but I feel like there's a way to critique uh, without being disrespectful. I think a lot of people in the media, you know, kind of take it personal and try to personally like disrespect the person and, and instead of kind of critiquing their game. And I feel like if you know the game well enough, you can critique their game and talk about plenty of other things without disrespecting the man or disrespecting the woman that you're critiquing. So again, it's a thin line that, you know, that I walk. Um, and I'm always, you know, someone to, I'm always will, willing to have a conversation if I say something, cause I'm not always going to say shit that people like, and I'm okay with that, but I'm someone that's no, I'm willing to have a conversation and hear you out. If you feel like I'm wrong, you know what I mean? Cause, cause no one's right all the time, but I just feel like so often today that, people are crossing that line of disrespect and kind of not keeping it professional from a journalistic standpoint or from a, um, um, you know, just a analyst standpoint and, and really taking personal shots at people. And that's just, that's just something I don't do. Yeah. Especially like with things that have been happening lately, you know, with the whole Kyrie Irving situation with uh, tweeting the link, um, getting an inside look into the back room before you go into you know, into a live taping, let's say on a first take or whatever, are there, are they giving you uh, narratives of how to portray a particular player? And even if you disagree with it, do you have to go with it just because no. you're obligated, it's contractual? Or do you just, hey, this is what we're talking about? Uh, give your take and what you think about it. And I think it's it's mostly the latter of what you said. Obviously, they want us to be original in our takes, but sometimes they do press certain issues or or hey what about this and and some guys will go with that and some guys won't you know sometimes i have okay you know that's a good point i'll use that too but you know for the most part you know i can only speak for myself you know i try to come up with my takes you know from studying and and, and watching you know watching the games and kind of just giving a player's point of view but there have been times where they say well why don't you say this i'm like ah i probably won't say that that's not me you know what i mean it doesn't sound like me i, I, don't, I don't even have that point of view um, but again, I can't speak for everyone. You know, everyone likes to think that oh, you guys are robots and you're controlled by the white man and you say what they want to say. Like I've never <laughs> been someone to say something I don't want to, or something I don't mean. Now that doesn't mean I've always been right because I've had to walk statements back before. And, and when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I'll, t I'll be the first one to tell you I'm wrong, but you're definitely not going to hear someone else's take or someone else's opinion mm -hmm. come out as my opinion. Yeah. And there's moments I've seen you on TV where, uh, clearly, like, if you really know basketball, you really know, like, what you or Rich or Perk are talking about. But for the other pundits who have never played ball at your level, it can seem, as a viewer, very frustrating to watch them act as if they know what you're going through as a player. So how do you collectively, as past players, manage, like, what are you talking? Like, not, not being able to get, like, visibly angry, but, like, how could you not avoid saying, hey, listen, I played in the NBA. You clearly don't know what you're talking about. That's not how it works. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Uh, I mean, it, you know, it is. And, and, and obviously, I'm not saying you have to have played that sport to be an expert in it. But you do have an expert opinion if you've played it. Uh, there's plenty of people that haven't played in the NBA that I really respect in, the, uh, in, in this space that, to me, have quality opinions. And, again, even if, you know, I'll disagree with Kendrick. 
you know what I mean, with Perk. And we both played in this space. So you're not always going to agree with your co-hosts or whoever else you're on the show with. And it, But again, you know, if, if it's ever something I feel passionate about, like I'm going to go back, you know, I, I remember Malika Andrews and I went back and forth about a Kobe situation. And I knew she was wrong 100%. And I knew I was right 100%. So, you know, with her being the host, you obviously want to be able to articulate your point without, again, even disrespecting her. You know what I mean? Because like I said, players don't want to be disrespected. Obviously, you don't want to disrespect your colleagues. But, you know, with an expertise that we have in this space, you know, again, if I feel like someone is we're on a panel and someone is saying some shit that's not true or how they think it is and it not is, I have no problem using my words, you know, uh, to be able to let them know, like, that, 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 that's not it. You know, you missed the ball. This is this is what it's more. This is more of what it's like. And again, just trying to make them see our side because again we have been there and we've done it yeah i will give you that you're you're a wordsmith when it comes on camera man i like <laughs> it's you, hard you make too it be, because because i be cussing so much like i'm a cusser you know what i mean like i tell my kids <laughs> to, to, to go do their fucking homework but it's not like a normal person saying fuck my my yeah. go do your homework is just like a regular person saying go do your homework in a higher pitch i'll say go do your fucking homework yeah. and my kids <laughs> smile and say okay dad you know right, what cool. i mean so when i when i'm on Obviously, the ESPN platform, I have to catch myself and a few shits have mm -hmm. slipped out here and there. But, you know, to be able to use, obviously, your words and, and, and be effective with them is, is something I, you know, try to continue to work on. Mm -hmm. Most definitely, man. Now, I want to ask something a little bit different. You know, I know you've been to Toronto to play ball, but have you like, been to Toronto to just like have a good time, you know, go out to eat? Like, have you been able to experience Toronto before? No, man, my brother played in Toronto. My brother played on the Argonauts and won the Gold, uh, gold Cup out there. Is that what it's called? The, the Great Cup. Great Cup. Great, great cup. cup, yeah. Yeah, my brother. And my brother has always raved. He said Toronto is like the greatest city in the world. And I never really got a chance to experience one. Every time I fucking came to Toronto, I had to sit in customs for like two or three hours. So I think my past has always kind of limited me from really kind of just going out there in the off season because every time I go with my team, luckily I'm with my team. So I might sit in customs for two or three hours, but they get me through. So if I went there solo and I don't really know Drake like that, I don't have no one to get me through customs, man. So I don't want to just be sit, sitting in customs, you know, at the Damn. airport. So the times I have been out, uh, I've enjoyed it. You guys have great feud food beautiful women and and a great nightlife but it's only really i've really only enjoyed that during the season when was the last time you you, you enjoyed toronto oh uh, man it was when i was playing it was when i was playing so um when was the last time i want to probably say with that clipper team because we used to go pretty hard with that clipper team and that was kind of towards the end of my career so i would say you know probably going out with those clipper guys out there i don't even remember where we went but we went to dinner and there was beautiful women there and there was a vibe and we went to the club and there was even more beautiful women there in the vibe and i was just like i'm almost glad this place isn't close to california because i would be over <laughs> here a lot getting into trouble man <laughs> all all nba guys that always talk about toronto toronto oh, toronto man, like what toronto is different. They, they love it here but they won't sign here i'm like we have everything for you but why aren't you it's a melting pot but it's also double tax you know what i mean if you're you know you're, you get taxed twice there so uh, but again, everything outside of that double tax and how far away it is, it, it's it's amazing. All right. I'm a, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not the biggest basketball guy. You know what I'm saying? But there's one thing that always rubbed me the wrong way was Kawhi leaving. You know, to want, Toronto. Yes, <laughs> man. Do you think that was a <laughs> like that was a smart move or a stupid move? Uh, I mean, I. I look at it from, I understand how fans can be mad, but how can you be mad about someone that came in and got you a championship? You know what I mean? I kind of look at it from that standpoint. You know what I mean? And I don't think he ever intended on staying there a long time. He just wanted to get out of San Antonio, and that was the easiest route to get out of San Antonio. But he was able to go to Toronto when you got a championship. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. beat one of the greatest teams of all time, although they were you know riddled with injuries, but that shit happened. So... I understand it was a tough move, and I feel like, you know, if he would have stayed, who knows, you know, what they would have been able to do, but he felt like it was time to, to, to move on, and unfortunately, he's really been injury-ridden since then, so I'm a big fan of Kawhi. Um, I love that he's with the Clippers because I'm still, you know, a Clipper homer at heart. I would love to see that team get over the hump finally, and, you know, shit, if anyone can help him do it, it could be Kawhi. 
It's Kawhi, man. Board man gets paid. And, and Matt, speaking about championships, man, because you at the tail end of your career, you won one with the Warriors uh, as KD was going down. Uh, how was that experience like to go your whole career from the early 2000s and finally get a ring, um, but not really play a lot, but you still get a championship? Like, well, yeah. how did you view that after, after you reflected as, a, okay, I'm an NBA champion, but there's that disconnect where, okay, I did not really fight every day on the yeah. court, but I might have yeah. prepped these guys a practice. We were battling out, but it didn't really materialize of you getting enough playing time because they're prioritizing like the younger guys who are like the Clays, the, I don't know who was on that roster, but you know who they were. No, it wasn't really so much that. So what happened was I went over there when Katie got hurt and, you know, stepped right into the rotation, you know, played, was playing 20, 25 minutes a game. And literally the game Katie came back, I sprained my ankle, like the worst sprain of my entire career. So like my ankle blew up. I thought I broke it. Luckily I didn't break it, but I didn't feel healthy and I still didn't even feel good when I tried to come back, but I didn't feel like I can even really run or do anything until the Western finals. And by that time, you know, our team was already eight. No. And me being a veteran player, like unless you're a superstar coming back from injury, you're not really going to crack that rotation. And I probably wasn't, if you look back on it, I wasn't really ready to play. I still couldn't really move like I wanted to move, but I wanted to try to see if I can get back out there. So, you know, I think obviously the experience was great that that team let me in and I was able to be a part, you know, on the team and, and won a championship. But I just looked at it from a standpoint of like, I've grinded my whole career. Nothing's been given to me. Um, and I feel like this was given to me because, again, I was injured. And then by the time I was ready to play, I played sparingly and kind of just had to sit there and, and, and cheer the team on, which was hard for me. But at the same time, again, I appreciated the opportunity and, and uh, you know, I took it. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing we want to talk about is this like working towards the future, you know, because one thing you did mention in the past interviews that you were, you were working on a, a podcast with AI. And on God, that would be fire. You know, talk to us. Is that still in the works? You know, um, any updates on that? Um, AI has been going through some stuff uh, in his personal life that kind of has slowed the process down. Uh, I would still love to make that happen. You know, it, we still have it mapped out for when he's ready, but obviously it would be on his time. But I just feel like, you know, he's a cultural icon. The world loves him. And I, I just want to people to continue to show him love because that's what he deserves. So, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully at some point we can uh, really sit down and, and, and finalize it because it's, you know, we have it mapped out already. So I'm hoping that that is something possibly in 2023 that we can uh, pull together. No, that's solid. Where do you see the, um, the landscape of podcasts growing in the next few years? Uh, I mean, podcasts are everywhere, you know, so to when, 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 when I tell people, you know, oh, I'm going to start a podcast, it's like, All right, what's going to, how is your podcast going to stand out from others? What's going to make yours different? Why are people going to want to listen to you? You know, so this is really a, a, a crowded space. It's a tough space to really kind of excel in. So I see the podcast space continuing to grow. And, you know, if you have something to say, people are going to listen. But if you're also unique at the same time, I think that's how you're going to continue to gain more recognition. So I think the sky is the limit for this podcast space. You know, there's so many new streaming services coming on board that I, I know that all are going to dip into the podcast space. So, again, I'm I'm glad that we're kind of at the forefront right now and and navigating mm -hmm. this space and seeing where we can take it. You know, I, I feel like you know our show is more in a podcast, and I feel like we can actually be on linear television. Um, so that too. would be kind of my my goal for our show. Um, so I'm going to continue to you know continue to just let the numbers do their to do the talking over at showtime and hopefully you know at some point we'll have a chance to really have our our, our show consistently because right now it's on showtime we do the best of once a week but i would like to actually have our shows on showtime so um you know that's my personal goal is to get us over to linear television yeah absolutely and there's this whole thing about um the new media right like where draymond came out saying the new media new media what i wanted to you know, get from you is like, do networks feel a threat from players actually dominating their own voice? Because they might go with a particular narrative, but now with so many players now formulating their own entities, like the boardroom with KD, like he can sit with, he can sit there with his co-host and dissect the game and actually give you like an in-depth analysis. 
do you see that as a threat to be towards the establishment? Are they seeing that? Are there internal talkings of, hey, like these guys are controlling their image? And yeah, what's your take on that? Uh, that's tough because I'm not in those rooms. So I'm not sure what they're thinking. Obviously, there's been a boom in athletes being able to intelligently get their point across. So I think it, it's always going to be a good thing. I'm sure a lot of people are threatened from it because, you know, we're coming over and, and, and somewhat taking people's jobs, you know, whether we don't take them directly out of their hands or not. But us, our ability, like you mentioned, for KD to be able to sit on his own show and, and give his takes, someone else is normally asking him that or, 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 or you know, kind of getting that out of him and same with all the smoke, you know, our ability to be able to get the best out of people like other people can't again, some people love it. Some people don't love it. You know what I mean? Some people feel like, damn, like, damn, we should be doing that. Or, you know, we're just as good. So, um, I don't know again, cause I'm not in, in you know, I'm not with the big machine. I, I, I somewhat work for a big machine, but I, I, I would think if I was a machine that these guys are good, let's sign them. You know, let's give them what they're worth so they can, you know, be under our umbrella. So, again, I can't necessarily answer that question, but I just know that it's it's great that there are more, are more athletes and more people being able to paint their own stories and, 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 and create their own narratives and not having other people do it for us. For athletes that are looking to get into the media space, what advice do you have for them? Uh, you got to want it. You know what I mean? And, and, and not all athletes because you play are, are cut out for media. You know, some guys can't get their point across and hopefully you have good people in your corner to tell you like, bro, this shit ain't for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if, <laughs> it, if, if it, if it is for you and you're serious, you got to treat it just like you treated the game. You know, you got to study it. You got to put the time in it. You got to have something to talk about. You got to be relatable. You got to be personable. And yeah. And that's it. I mean, obviously athletes are going to have a chance because you know, everyone always wants to know what we think. And if you're able to really get your point across, there are going to be opportunities for you to capitalize um on that so it's a very crowded field but to me the more the merrier like i said i love that everyone has a chance to tell their own story so i think it's only continue to grow not just athletes but i think across the board more and more people are just doing podcasts so i think at some point it's really going to start taking over not maybe not the major news outlets but you know kind of the smaller news outlets are going to probably disappear because you know, what's the point of talking to them? If you can't talk to ESPN or a TNT, mm -hmm. what's the point of really, you know, because, you know, with it, all the smoke is going to get someone. Old Man at Three is going to get someone. The boardroom is going to get someone. So it's really like I think we're kind of competing with uh, not necessarily the top tier, although we sometimes are neck and neck with those the top tier people. But I think like the next the, the next people in line, I think podcasts are kind of, you know, wiping those people out. No, nah, most definitely. You know, um, as work was wrapping up, you know, I got, got to ask this. Who do you see taking the Eastern Conference? I love Boston right now, man. And despite all the shit they went through in the offseason and them not really having Robert Williams right now, I really like them. I think when they get Robert Williams back, it's only going to help. And then I also like Milwaukee. Um, I think Milwaukee, you know, Middleton is back, and I think they're going to be – so those are my two in the Eastern Conference. Although I like Toronto. You know, you never know. Toronto's solid. You know what I mean? But I feel like they may be missing one key. I think they have a lot of good young talent. And shout out my brothers, Rico Hines and Earl Watson, former UCLA teammates that are over there coaching now. I really like that team. I just don't think they're as good as Boston or um, Milwaukee. And then out of the Western Conference, I feel like Golden State will rise to the top. And if Kawhi can stay healthy, I think it'll be the Clippers and – Golden State battling in the West, and it'll be Boston and Milwaukee battling in the East. Mm. What about Memphis, man? Memphis is a, is a I like tough, Memphis. tough team. I think Memphis, Memphis is next is... in line. I think once, yeah. you know, CP is gone from Phoenix, and I think once this Warrior team, I think this Memphis team will take the crown, like the, not the title, like the championship title, but I think they'll, you know, hop over the Warriors within the next – two years maybe they feel mm -hmm. like shit if they were healthy last year they should have won you know what i mean so mm -hmm. i really like this memphis team i'm not sure if they're ready yet i feel like they don't necessarily have a consistent number two although bain is playing good basketball this year i don't know if he's a consistent number two in the playoffs um but john morant is the future the way his team acts is the new nba and i love it you know they're they're jumping around they're they're they're, they're shooting music videos it seems like every interview 
uh, these guys are just having fun with basketball. And I think kind of, I know some of the older people don't like it, but again, I coach younger kids, so I see how they act. So I, I love the way Memphis is acting. Oh, that's my little man with his haircut. I love the way Memphis is acting. I love the way Atlanta with, with Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. I think like this new shit talking, having fun basketball is is here to stay. So I think Memphis is definitely going to be have something to say in the next two years, three years about who's, you know, where the top, where, where the Western Conference runs through. Yeah. And speaking about the youngins, man, I know you got three boys and uh, your twins, you know, like they're growing. Like I remember like when you're playing, they're like little boys, but now they're hooping, hooping on the circuit. Um, how do you feel about like, like them hooping and like, are they, fo- are they trying to follow your footsteps? How are you guiding them in the basketball journey? Like walk us through that. I love them. I want them to be happy. You know, I want them to love what they're doing. Um, obviously, basketball is something they've migrated to because of me. But, you know, I want to give them every opportunity to be better than me. Um, you know, to me, they already they already shoot better than me. You know, these guys are some shooters. So I just think, you know, my whole goal with them is to not push them. You know, I want them to love it. So that, And then once they start to fall in love with it, which is kind of like a year ago, now I'm going to put them in the best situation. You know, outside of me training them here and there when I have time, I'm putting them with the best trainers. You know, they're going to start strength and conditioning. So my whole goal is to peak at the right time. You know, I feel like basketball is so – everyone thinks their child's going to the NBA, and they're so caught up in stats and rankings. And I, I try to tell my kids and my team, it's just like being the best 11, 12, 13, 14, or doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? Like you want to continue to improve, and when it's time to peak, you know, your junior, your senior year, or going into college or wherever you're going from high school – to me, that's the time to peak. So, I mean, I think that's the scale that my boys are on. I think they're going to peak at the right time, and they're going to be tough. You know what I mean? But even with that said, there's no guarantee they're going to be able to to make it. So whether they make it or not, I just want to make sure they're prepared. You know, they have their own podcast called the Barnes Boys Podcast. It's super dope, and, you know, I'm teaching them the business behind that and understanding how, how big content is in this space, and they got a couple deals brewing. So, you know, whether it's sports or whether it's business, I just want to make sure that they're prepared for – you know this world no nah, that's man, huge. respect for you showing them the way man that's big that's big time yeah, appreciate man. it awesome man. as we're towards wrapping up any quote that has impacted you that we could share with our audience uh, quote 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 it's part of a tupac quote like i he, i think he says some to this effect that i won't change the world but i hope i spark the mind that does um you know i'm always out here you know, being fortunate enough to have made it and, and lived out my dream, trying to encourage and motivate the next to do it. You know what I mean? So I just hope that, you know, through my actions and through my work and through my charitable causes and me giving back that I, I, I spark the mind that, you know, brings the world, whatever the world is looking for. No, that's beautiful. With that being said, the hustle is what you can control. So control your grind and control your life. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen Osinde. And, and I'm Matt Barnes, man. I appreciate you guys. <laughs> there we go. There awesome, we go. Man. There awesome we go, man. Y'all. Boom. Boom.